Chapter Two, Part Two of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Celine Major. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three by Eugène Sue. Chapter Two, Part Two of The Arrest. One day, said Louise in continuation, the housekeeper went out directly after dinner, contrary to her usual custom. The clerks, none of whom lived in the house, were dismissed from further duty for the day and retired to their respective homes the porter was sent out on a message leaving m ferrand and myself alone in the house i was doing some needlework madame seraphin had given me and by her orders was sitting in a small antechamber from whence i could hear if i was wanted after some time the bell of my master's bedroom rang i went there immediately and upon entering found him standing before the fire as i approached he turned around suddenly and caught me in his arms alarm and surprise at first deprived me of power to move but spite of his great strength i at last struggled so successfully that i managed to free myself from his grasp and running back with all speed to the room i had just quitted i hastily shut the door and held it with all my force unfortunately the key was on the other side you hear sir you hear said morel to rodolph the manner in which this generous benefactor behaved to the daughter of the man he affected to serve at the end of a few minutes continued louise the door yielded to the efforts of m ferrand fortunately the lamp by which i had been working was within my reach and i precipitately extinguished it the antechamber was at some distance from his bedchamber and we were therefore left in utter darkness at first he called me by name but finding that i did not reply he exclaimed in a voice trembling with rage and passion if you try to escape me your father shall go to prison for the thirteen hundred francs he owes and is unable to pay i besought him to have pity on me promised to do all in my power to serve him faithfully and with gratitude for all his goodness to my family but declared that no consideration on earth should induce me to disgrace myself or those i belong to there spoke my louise said morel or rather as she would have spoken in her days of proud innocence how then if such were your sentiments but go on go on i was still concealed by the darkness which i trusted would preserve me when i heard the door closed which led from the antechamber and which my master had contrived to find by groping along the wall thus having me wholly in his power he returned to his chamber for a light with which he quickly returned and then commenced a fresh attack the particulars of which my dearest father i will not venture to describe suffice it that promises threats violence all were tried but anger fear and despair armed me with fresh strength and while i continually eluded his grasp and fled for safety from room to room his rage at my determined resistance knew no bounds in his fury he even struck me with such frenzied violence as to leave my features streaming with blood you hear you hear exclaimed the lapidary raising his clasped hands towards heaven and are crimes like this to go unpunished shall such a monster escape and not pay a heavy penalty for his wickedness trust me said rodolph who seemed profoundly meditating on what he heard trust me this man's time and hour will come but continue your painful narration my poor girl and shrink not from telling us even its blackest details the struggle between us had now gone on so long that my strength began to fail me i was conscious of my own inability to resist further when the porter who had returned home rang the bell twice the usual signal when letters arrived and required to be fetched from his hands fearing that if i did not obey the summons the porter would bring the letters himself m ferrand said go utter but one word and to-morrow sees your father in prison if you endeavour to quit this house the consequences will fall on him and as for you i will take care no one shall take you into their house for without exactly affirming it i will contrive to make every one think you have robbed me then should any person refer to me for your character i shall speak of you as an idle unworthy girl whom i could keep no longer the following day after this scene spite of the menaces of my master i ran home to complain to my father of the unkind usage i received without daring however to tell him all his first desire was for me to quit the house of m ferrand without delay but then a prison would close upon my poor parent added to which 
my small earnings had become indispensably necessary to our family since the illness of my mother and the bad character promised me by m ferrand might possibly have prevented me from finding another service for a very long time yes said morel with gloomy bitterness we were selfish and cowardly enough to allow our poor child to return to that accursed roof oh i spoke truly when i said want want what mean what degrading acts do you not force us to commit alas dear father did you not try by every possible means to procure these thirteen hundred francs and that being impossible there was nothing left but to submit ourselves to our fate go on go on your parents have been your executioners and we are far more guilty than yourself of all the fearful consequences exclaimed the lapidary concealing his face with his hands when i next saw my master said louise he had resumed the harsh and severe manner with which he ordinarily treated me he made not the slightest reference to the scene i have just related while his housekeeper persisted in her accustomed tormenting and unkind behaviour towards me giving me scarcely sufficient food to maintain my strength and even locking the bread up so that i could not help myself to a morsel she would even carry her cruelty so far as to wilfully spoil and damage the morsels left by herself and m ferrand for my repasts i always taking my meals after my master and the housekeeper who invariably sat down to table together my nights were as painful as my days i durst not indulge in sleep lest i should be surprised by the entrance of the notary i had no means of securing my chamber door and the chest of drawers which i used to fasten myself in had been taken away leaving me only a small table a chair and my box with these articles i barricaded the door as well as i could and merely lay down in my clothes ready to start up at the least noise some time elapsed however without my having any further alarm as regarded m ferrand who seemed to have altogether forgotten me and seldom bestowed even a look on me by degrees my fears died away and i became almost persuaded i had nothing more to dread from the persecutions of my master one sunday i had permission to visit my home and with extreme delight hastened to announce the happy change that had taken place to my parents oh how we all rejoiced to think so up to that moment my dear father you know all that occurred what i have still to tell you murmured louise as her voice sunk into an inarticulate whisper is so dreadful that i have never dared reveal it i was sure oh, too sure cried morel with a wildness of manner and rapidity of utterance which startled and alarmed rodolph that you were hiding something from me too plainly did i perceive by your pale and altered countenance that your mind was burthened with some heavy secret many a time have i said to your mother but she poor thing would not listen to me and even blamed me for making myself unnecessarily miserable so you see that weakly and selfish to escape from trouble ourselves we allowed our poor helpless child to remain under this monster's roof and to what have we reduced our poor girl why to be classed with the felons and criminals of a prison see see what comes of parents sacrificing their children and then too be it remembered after all who knows true we are poor very poor and may be guilty yes yes quite right guilty of throwing our daughter into shame and disgrace but then see how wretched and distressed we were besides such as we then as if suddenly striving to collect his bewildered ideas morel struck his forehead exclaiming alas i know not what i say my brain burns and my senses seem deserting me a sort of bewilderment seems to come over me as though i were stupefied with drink alas alas i am going mad so saying the unhappy man buried his face between his hands unwilling that louise should perceive the extent of his apprehensions as regarded the agitated state of the lapidary and how much alarm he felt at his wild incoherent language rodolph gravely replied you are unjust morel it was not for herself alone but for her aged and afflicted parent her children and you that your poor wife dreaded the consequences of louise's quitting the notary's house accuse no one but let all your just anger your bitter curses fall on the head that alone deserves it on that hypocritical monster who offered a weak and helpless girl the alternative of infamy or ruin perhaps destruction 
perhaps death to those she most tenderly loved on the fiend who could thus abuse the power he held thus prey upon the tenderest holiest feelings of a loving daughter thus shamelessly outrage every moral and religious duty but patience as i have before remarked providence frequently reserves for crimes so black as this a fearful and astounding retribution as rodolph uttered these words he spoke with a tone so expressive of his own conviction of the certain vengeance of heaven that louise gazed at her preserver with a surprise not unmingled with fear go on my poor girl resumed rodolph addressing louise conceal nothing from us it is more important than you can be aware that you should relate the most minute details of your sad story thus encouraged louise proceeded i began therefore as i told you to regain my tranquillity when one evening both m ferrand and his housekeeper went out they did not dine at home i was quite alone in the house as usual my allowance of bread wine and water was left for me and every place carefully locked when i had finished my work i took the food placed for me and having made my meal i retired to my bedroom thinking it less dull than remaining downstairs by myself i took care to leave a light in the hall for my master as when he dined out no one ever sat up for him once in my chamber i seated myself and commenced my sewing but contrary to my usual custom i found the greatest difficulty in keeping myself awake a heavy drowsiness seemed to steal over and a weight like lead seemed to press on my eyelids alas dear father cried louise interrupting herself as though frightened at her own recital i feel sure you will not credit what i am about to say you will believe i am uttering falsehoods and yet here over the lifeless body of my poor little sister i swear to the truth of each word i speak explain yourself my good girl said rodolph indeed sir answered louise you ask me to do that i have been vainly trying to accomplish during the last seven months in vain have i racked my brains to endeavour to account for the events of that fatal night sometimes i have almost grown distracted while trying to clear up this fearful and mysterious occurrence merciful heaven exclaimed the lapidary suddenly rousing from one of those fits of almost apathetic stupor into which he had occasionally fallen from the very commencement of this narration what dreadful thing is she going to tell us this lethargic feeling continued louise so completely overpowered me that unable any longer to resist it i at length contrary to my usual custom fell asleep upon my chair this is all i recollect before before oh forgive me father forgive me indeed indeed i am not guilty yet i believe you i believe you but proceed i know not how long i slept but when i awoke it was to shame and dishonour for i found m ferrand beside me tis false tis false screamed the lapidary in a tone of frenzied violence confess that you yielded to violence or to the dread of seeing me dragged to prison but do not seek to impose on me by falsehood such as this father father i call heaven to witness i am telling you the truth only i tell you tis a base falsehood why should the notary have wished to throw me in prison since you had freely yielded to his wishes yielded oh no dear father i would have died first so deep was my sleep that it resembled that of death it may seem to you both extraordinary and impossible and i assure you that up to the present hour i myself have never been able to understand it or account for it but i can do so at once said rodolph interrupting louise this crime alone was wanting to complete the heavy calendar of that man's offences accuse not your daughter morel of seeking to deceive you tell me louise when you made your meal before ascending to your chamber did you not remark something peculiar in the taste of the wine given you to drink try and recollect this circumstance after reflecting a short time louise replied yes i do indeed remember answered she that the wine and water left for me as usual had a somewhat bitter taste but i did not pay much attention to it because the housekeeper would frequently when spitefully inclined amuse herself with throwing salt or pepper into what i drank but on the day you were describing your wine had a bitter taste it had sir but not sufficiently so to prevent my drinking it and i attributed it to the wine being turned 
morel with fixed eye and haggard look listened both to the questions of rodolph and the answers of louise without appearing to understand to what they tended and before falling asleep on your chair did not your head seem unusually heavy and your limbs weary oh yes sir i felt a fullness and throbbing in my temples an icy coldness seemed to fill my veins and a feeling of unusual discomfort oppressed me wretch villainous wretch exclaimed rodolph are you aware morel what this man made your poor child take in her wine the artisan gazed at rodolph without replying to his question his accomplice the housekeeper had mingled in louise's drink some sort of stupefying drug most probably opium by which means both the bodily and mental powers of your unfortunate daughter were completely paralyzed for several hours and when she awoke from this lethargic state it was to find herself dishonoured and disgraced and now exclaimed louise my misfortune is explained you see dear father i am less guilty than you thought me father dear dear father look upon me bestow one little look of pity and of pardon on your poor louise but the glance of the lapidary was fixed and vacant his honest mind could not comprehend the idea of so black so monstrous a crime as that ascribed to the notary and he gazed with blank wonder at the words he heard as though quite unable to affix any meaning to them and besides during the latter part of the discourse his intellect became evidently shaken his ideas became a shapeless confused mass of wandering recollections a mere chaotic mass of griefs and sorrows possessed his brain and he sank into a state of mental prostration which is to intellect what darkness is to the sight the formidable symptoms of a weakened brain after a pause of some length morel replied in a low hasty tone yes yes it is bad very very bad cannot be worse and then relapsed into his former apathy while rodolph watching him with pained attention perceived that the energy even of indignation was becoming exhausted within the mind of the miserable father in the same manner as excessive grief will frequently dry up the relief of tears anxious to put an end as quickly as possible to the present trying scene rodolph said to louise proceed my poor child and let us have the remainder of this tissue of horrors alas sir what you have heard is as nothing to that which follows when i perceived m ferrand by my side i uttered a cry of terror my first impulse was to rush from the room but m ferrand forcibly detained me and i still felt so weak so stupefied with the medicine you speak of as having been mingled in my drink that i was powerless as an infant why do you wish to escape from me now inquired m ferrand with an air of surprise which filled me with dread what fresh caprice is this am i not here by your own free will and consent oh sir exclaimed i this is most shameful and unworthy to take advantage of my sleep to work my ruin but my father shall know all here my master interrupted me by bursting into loud laughter upon my word young lady said he you are very amusing so you are going to say that i availed myself of your being asleep to effect your undoing but who do you suppose will credit such a falsehood it is now four in the morning and since ten o'clock last night i have been here you must have slept long and soundly not to have discovered my presence sooner come come no more attempts at shyness but confess the truth that i came hither with your perfect good will and consent you must be less capricious or we shall not keep good friends i fear your father is in my power you have no longer any cause to fly me be obedient to my wishes and we shall do very well together but resist me and the consequences shall fall heavily on you and your family likewise i will tell my dear father of your conduct sobbed i he will avenge me and the laws will punish you m ferrand looked at me as though at a loss to comprehend me why you have lost your senses cried he what in heaven's name can you tell your father that you thought proper to invite me to your bedroom but invent any tale you please you will soon find what sort of a reception it will meet with why your father will not look at you much more believe you but you know cried i you well know sir i gave no permission for your being here you are well aware you entered my chamber without my knowledge and are now here against my will against your will 
and is it possible you have the effrontery to utter such a falsehood to dare insinuate that i have employed force to gain my ends do you wish to be convinced of the folly of such an imputation why by my orders germain my cashier returned here last night at ten o'clock to complete some very important papers and until one o'clock this morning he was writing in the chamber directly under yours would he not then have been sure to have heard the slightest sound much less the repetition of such a struggle as we had together a little while ago my saucy little beauty when you were not quite in as complying a humour as i found you in last evening germain must have heard you during the stillness of the night had you but called for assistance ask him when you see him whether any such sound occurred he will tell you no and that he worked on uninterruptedly during the very hours you are accusing me of forcibly entering your bedchamber ah cried rodolph the villain had evidently taken every precaution to prevent detection he had indeed as for me sir continued louise i was so thunderstruck with horror at these assertions of m ferrand that i knew not what to reply ignorant of my having taken anything to induce sleep i felt wholly unable to account for my having slept so unusually heavy and long appearances were strongly against me what would it avail for me to publish the dreadful story no one would believe me innocent how indeed could i hope or expect they should even when to myself the events of that fatal night continued an impenetrable mystery even rodolph remained speechless with horror at this fearful revelation of the diabolical hypocrisy of m ferrand then said he after a pause of some minutes you never ventured to inform your father of the infamous treatment you had received no answered she for i dreaded lest he might suppose i had willingly listened to the persuasions of my master and i also feared that in the first burst of his indignation my poor father would forget that not only his own freedom but the very existence of his family depended upon the pleasure of m ferrand and probably continued rodolph desirous if possible to save louise the painful confession probably yielding to constraint and the dread of endangering the safety of your father and family by a refusal you continued to be the victim of this monster's brutality louise spoke not but her cast-down eyes and the deep blushes which dyed her pale cheek answered most painfully in the affirmative and was his conduct afterwards less barbarous and unfeeling than before not in the least and when by chance my master had the curé and vicaire de bonne nouvelle to dine with him the better to avert all suspicion from himself he would scold me severely in their presence and even beg m le curé to admonish me assuring him that some day or other i should fall into ruin that i was a girl of free and bold manners and that he could not make me keep my distance with the young men in his office that i was an idle unworthy person whom he only kept out of charity and pity for my father who was an honest man with a large family whom he had greatly served and obliged with the exception of that part of the statement which referred to my father the rest was utterly false i never by any chance saw the clerks belonging to his office as it was situated in a building entirely detached from the house and when alone with m ferrand how did he account for his treatment of you before the cure he assured me he was only jesting however the cure believed him and reprehended me very severely saying that a person must be vicious indeed to go astray in so godly a household where i had none but the most holy and religious examples before my eyes i knew not what answer to make to this address i felt my cheeks burn and my eyes involuntarily cast down all these indications of shame and confusion were construed to my disadvantage until at length sick at heart and weary and disgusted my very life seemed a burden to me and many times i felt tempted to destroy myself but the thoughts of my parents my poor brothers and sisters that my small earnings helped to maintain deterred me from ending my sorrows by death i therefore resigned myself to my wretched fate finding one consolation amidst the degradation of my lot in the thought that at least i had preserved my father from the horrors of a prison but a fresh misfortune overwhelmed me i became enceinte i now felt myself lost indeed a secret presentiment assured me that when m ferrand became aware of a circumstance which ought at least to have rendered him less harsh and cruel he would treat me even more unkindly than before i was still however far from expecting what afterwards occurred 
at this moment morel recovering from his temporary abstraction gazed around him as though trying to collect his ideas then pressing his hand upon his forehead looked at his daughter with an inquiring glance and said i fancy i have been ill or something is wrong with my head grief fatigue tell me my child what were you saying just now i seem almost unable to recollect when continued louise unheeding her father's look when m ferrand discovered that i was likely to become a mother here the lapidary waved his hand in despairing agony but rodolph calmed him by an imploring look yes yes said morel let me hear all tis fit and right the tale should be told go on go on my girl and i will listen from beginning to end louise went on i besought m ferrand to tell me by what means i should conceal my shame and the consequence of a crime of which he was the author alas dear father i can scarcely hope or believe you will credit what i am about to tell you what did he say speak interrupting me with much indignation and well-feigned surprise he affected not to understand my meaning and even inquired whether i had lost my senses terrified i exclaimed oh sir what is to become of me alas if you have no pity on me pity at least the poor infant that must soon see the light what a lost depraved character cried m ferrand raising his clasped hands towards heaven horrible indeed why you poor wretched girl is it possible that you have the audacity to accuse me of disgracing myself by any illicit acquaintance with a person of your infamous description can it be that you have the hardihood to lay the fruits of your immoral conduct and gross irregularity at my door i who have repeated a hundred times in the presence of respectable witnesses that you would come to ruin some day vile profligate that you are quit my house this instant or i will drive you out rodolph and morel were struck with horror a system of wickedness like this seemed to freeze their blood by heaven cried rodolph this surpasses any horrors that imagination could have conceived morel did not speak but his eyes expanded fearfully whilst a convulsive spasm contracted his features he quitted the stool on which he was sitting opened a drawer suddenly and taking out a long and very sharp file fixed in a wooden handle he rushed towards the door rodolph guessing his thoughts seized his arm and stopped his progress morel where are you going you will do a mischief unhappy man take care exclaimed the infuriated artisan struggling or i shall commit two crimes instead of one and the madman threatened rodolph father it is our benefactor exclaimed louise he is jesting at us he wants to save the notary replied morel quite crazed and struggling with rodolph at the end of a second the latter disarmed him carefully opened the door and threw the file out on the staircase louise ran to the lapidary embraced him and said father it is our benefactor you have raised your hand against him recover yourself these words recalled morel to himself and hiding his face in his hands he fell mutely on his knees before rodolph rise rise unhappy father said rodolph in accents of great kindness be patient be patient i understand your wrath and share your hatred but in the name of your vengeance do not compromise your daughter louise my daughter cried the lapidary rising but what can justice the law do against that we are but poor wretches and were we to accuse this rich powerful and respected man we should be laughed to scorn ha 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 and he laughed convulsively and they would be right where would be our proofs yes our proofs no one would believe us so i tell you i tell you he added with increased fury i tell you that i have no confidence but in the impartiality of my knife silence morel your grief distracts you said rodolph to him sorrowfully let your daughter speak the moments are precious the magistrate waits i must know all all i tell you go on my child morel fell back on the stool overwhelmed with his anguish it is useless sir continued louise to tell you of my tears my prayers i was thunderstruck this took place at ten o'clock in the morning in m ferrand's private room the curate was coming to breakfast with him 
and entered at the moment when my master was assailing me with reproach and accusations he appeared much put out at the sight of the priest what occurred then oh he soon recovered himself and exclaimed call him by name well monsieur l'abbé i said so i said this unhappy girl would be undone she is ruined ruined for ever she has just confessed to me her fault and her shame and entreated me to save her only think that from commiseration i have received such a wanton into my house how said the abbe to me with indignation in spite of the excellent counsels which your master has given you a hundred times in my presence have you really sunk so low oh it is unpardonable my friend my friend after the kindness you have evinced towards this wretched girl and her family any pity would be weakness be inexorable said the abbe the dupe like the rest of the world of m ferrand's hypocrisy End of chapter two part two read by celine major chapter two part three of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by celine major the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene Sue. chapter two part three of the arrest and you did not unmask the scoundrel on the spot asked rodolph oh no monsieur i was terrified my head was in a whirl i did not dare i could not pronounce a word yet i was anxious to speak and defend myself but sir i cried not one word more unworthy creature said m ferrand interrupting me you heard m l'abbé pity would be weakness in an hour you leave my house then without allowing me time to reply he led the abbe into another room after the departure of m ferrand resumed louise i was almost bereft of my senses for a moment i was driven from his house and unable to find any home elsewhere in consequence of my condition and the bad character which my master would give with me i felt sure too that in his rage he would send my father to prison and i did not know what to do i went to my room and there i wept bitterly at the end of two hours m ferrand appeared is your bundle made up said he pardon i exclaimed falling at his feet do not turn me from your house in my present condition what will become of me i have no place to turn to so much the better this is the way that god punishes loose behaviour and falsehood dare you say that i tell falsehood i asked indignantly dare you say that it is not you who have caused my ruin leave my house this moment you wretch since you persist in your calumnies he replied in a terrible voice and to punish you i will to-morrow send your father to the jail well no no said i terrified i will not again accuse you sir that i promise you but do not drive me away from the house have pity on my father the little i earn here helps to support my family keep me here i will say nothing i will endeavour to hide everything and when i can no longer do so oh then but not till then send me away after fresh entreaties on my part m ferrand consented to keep me with him and i considered that a great favour in my wretched condition during the time that followed this cruel scene i was most wretched and miserably treated only sometimes m germain whom i seldom saw kindly asked me what made me unhappy but shame prevented me from confessing anything to him was not that about the time when he came to reside here yes sir he was looking out for an apartment near the rue du temple or de l'arsenal there was one to let here and i told him of that one which you now occupy sir and it suited him exactly when he quitted it about two months ago he begged me not to mention his new address here but that they knew it at m ferrand's the necessity under which germain was to conceal himself from those who were trying to find him explained all these precautions to rodolph and it never occurred to you to make a confidant of germain he said to louise no sir he was also a dupe to the hypocrisy of m ferrand he called him harsh and exacting but he thought him the honestest man on the face of the earth when germain was lodging here did he never hear your father at times accuse the notary of desiring to seduce you my father never expressed his fears before strangers and besides at this period i deceived his uneasiness and comforted him by the assurances that m ferrand no longer thought of me alas 
my poor father will now forgive me those falsehoods i only employed them to tranquillize your mind father dear that was all morel made no reply he only leaned his forehead on his two arms crossed on his working-board and sobbed bitterly rodolph made a sign to louise not to address herself to her father and she continued thus i led from this time a life of tears and perpetual anguish by using every precaution i had contrived to conceal my condition from all eyes but i could not hope thus to hide it during the last two months the future became more and more alarming to me as m ferrand had declared that he would not keep me any longer in the house and therefore i should be deprived of the small resources which assisted our family to live cursed and driven from my home by my father for after the falsehoods i had told him to set his mind at ease he would believe me the accomplice and not the victim of m ferrand what was to become of me where could i find refuge or place myself in my condition i then had a criminal idea but fortunately i recoiled from putting it into execution i confess this to you sir because i will not keep anything concealed not even that which may tell against myself and thus i may show you the extremities to which i was reduced by the cruelty of m ferrand if i had given way to such a thought would he not have been the accomplice of my crime after a moment's silence louise resumed with great effort and in a trembling voice i had heard say by the porteress that a quack doctor lived in the house and she could not finish rodolph recollected that at his first interview with madame pipelet he had received from the postman in her absence a letter written on coarse paper in a feigned hand and on which he had remarked the traces of tears and you wrote to him unhappy girl three days since you wept over your letter and the handwriting was disguised louise looked at rodolph in great consternation how did you know that sir do not alarm yourself i was alone in madame pipelet's lodge when they brought in the letter and i remarked it quite accidentally yes sir it was mine in this letter which bore no signature i wrote to mr bradamanti saying that as i did not dare to go to him i would beg him to be in the evening near the chateau d'eau i had lost my senses i sought fearful advice from him and i left my master's house with the intention of following them but at the end of a minute my reason returned to me and i saw what a crime i was about to commit i returned to the house and did not attend the appointment i had written for that evening an event occurred the consequences of which caused the misfortune which has overwhelmed me m ferrand thought i had gone out for a couple of hours whilst in reality i had been gone but a very short time as i passed before the small garden gate to my great surprise i saw it half open i entered by it and took the key into m ferrand's private room where it was usually kept this apartment was next to his bedroom the most retired place in the house and it was there he had his private meetings with clients and others transacting his everyday business in the office you will see sir why i give you these particulars as i very well knew the ways of the apartments after having crossed the dining-room which was lighted up i entered into the salon without any candle and then into the little closet which was on this side of his sleeping-room the door of this latter opened at the moment when i was putting the key on a table and the moment my master saw me by the light of the lamp which was burning in his chamber then he suddenly shut the door on some person whom i could not see and then in spite of the darkness rushed towards me and seizing me by the throat as if he would strangle me said in a low voice and in a tone at once savage and alarmed what listening spying at the door what did you hear answer me answer directly or i'll strangle you but suddenly changing his idea and not giving me time to say a word he drove me back into the dining-room the office door was open and he brutally thrust me in and shut the door and you did not hear the conversation not a word sir if i had known that there was any one in his room with him i should have been careful not to have gone there he even forbade madame seraphin from doing so and when you left the office what did he say to you it was the housekeeper who let me out and i did not see m ferrand again that night his violence to me and the fright i had undergone made me very ill indeed the next day at the moment when i went downstairs i met m ferrand and i shuddered when i remembered his threats of the night before what then was my surprise when he said to me calmly 
you knew that i forbid any one to enter my private room when i have any person there but for the short time longer you will stay here it is useless to scold you any more and then he went into his study this mildness astonished me after his violence of the previous evening i went on with my work as usual and was going to put his bedchamber to rights i had suffered a great deal all night and was weak and exhausted whilst i was hanging up some clothes in a dark closet at the end of the room near the bed i was suddenly seized with a painful giddiness and felt as if i should lose my senses as i fell i tried to support myself by grasping at a large cloak which hung against the wainscot but in my fall i drew his cloak down on me and was almost entirely covered by it when i came to myself the glass door of the above closet was shut i heard m ferrand's voice he was speaking aloud remembering the scene of the previous evening i thought i should be killed if i stirred i suppose that hidden by the cloak which had fallen on me my master did not perceive me when he shut the door of this dark wardrobe if he found me how could i account for and make him believe this singular accident i therefore held my breath and in spite of myself overheard the conclusion of this conversation which no doubt had begun some time and who was the person who was talking with the notary and shut up in this room with him inquired rodolph of louise i do not know sir i did not recognize the voice and what were they saying no doubt they had been conversing some time but all i heard was this nothing more easy said the unknown voice a fellow named bras rouge has put me for the affair i mentioned to you just now in connection with a family of fresh-water pirates note one established on the point of a small islet near asnières they are the greatest scoundrels on earth the father and grandfather were guillotined two of the sons were condemned to the galleys for life but there are still left a mother three sons and two daughters all as infamous as they can possibly be they say that at night in order to plunder on both sides of the seine they sometimes come down in their boats as low as bercy they are ruffians who will kill any one for a crown piece but we shall not want their aid further than their hospitality for your lady from the country the martial that is the name of these pirates will pass in her eyes for an honest family of fishers i will go as if from you to pay two or three visits to your young lady i will order her a few comforting draughts and at the end of a week or ten days she will form an acquaintance with the burial ground of asnières in villages deaths are looked on as nothing more than a letter by the post whilst in paris they are a little more curious in such matters but when do you send your young lady from the provinces to the isle of asnières for i must give the martial notice of the part they have to play she will arrive here to-morrow and next day i shall send her to them replied m ferrand and i shall tell her that dr vincent will pay her a visit at my request ah vincent will do as well as any other name said the voice note one we shall hear more particulars of these worthies in another chapter what new mystery of crime and infamy said rodolph with increased astonishment new no sir you will see that it is in connection with another crime that you know of resumed louise who thus continued i heard a movement of chairs the interview had ended i do not ask the secret of you said m ferrand you behave to me as i behave to you thus we may mutually serve without any power mutually to injure each other answered the voice observe my zeal i received your letter at ten o'clock last night and here i am this morning good-bye accomplice do not forget the isle of asnières the fisher martial and dr vincent thanks to these three magic words your country damsel has only eight days to look forward to wait said m ferrand whilst i go and undo the safety bolt which i have drawn to in my closet and let me look out and see that there is no one in the antechamber in order that you may go out by the side path in the garden by which you entered m ferrand went out for a moment and then returned and i heard him go away with the person whose voice i did not know you may imagine my fright sir during this conversation and my despair at having unintentionally discovered such a secret two hours after this conversation madame seraphin came to me in my room whither i had gone trembling all over and worse than i had been yet my master is inquiring for you said she to me you are better off than you deserve to be come go downstairs you are very pale but what you are going to hear will give you a colour 
i followed madame seraphin and found m ferrand in his private study when i saw him i shuddered in spite of myself and yet he did not look so disagreeable as usual he looked at me steadfastly for some time as if he would read the bottom of my thoughts i lowered my eyes you seem very ill he said yes sir i replied much surprised at being thus addressed it is easily accounted for added he it is the result of your condition and the efforts you make to conceal it but in spite of your falsehoods your bad conduct and your indiscretion yesterday he added in a milder tone i feel pity for you a few days more and it will be impossible to conceal your situation although i have treated you as you deserve before the curate of the parish such an event in the eyes of the world will be the disgrace of a house like mine and moreover your family will be deeply distressed under these circumstances i will come to your aid ah sir i cried such kind words from you make me forget everything forget what asked he hastily nothing nothing forgive me sir i replied fearful of irritating him and believing him kindly disposed towards me then attend to me said he you will go to see your father to-day and tell him that i am going to send you into the country for two or three months to take care of a house which i have just bought during your absence i will send your wages to him to-morrow you will leave paris i will give you a letter of introduction to madame martial the mother of an honest family of fishers who live near asnières you will say you came from the country and nothing more you will learn hereafter my motive for this introduction which is for your good madame martial will treat you as one of the family and a medical man of my acquaintance dr vincent will give you all you require in your situation you see how kind i am to you what a horrible snare exclaimed rodolph i see it all now believing that overnight you had listened to some secret no doubt very important for him he desired to get rid of you he had probably an interest in deceiving his accomplice by describing you as a female from the country what must have been your alarm at this proposal it was like a violent blow it quite bereft me of sense i could not reply but looked at m ferrand aghast my head began to wander i should perhaps have risked my life by telling him that i had overheard his projects in the morning when fortunately i recollected the fresh perils to which such an avowal would expose me you do not understand me then he said impatiently yes sir but i added all trembling i should prefer not going into the country why not you shall be taken every care of where i send you no no i will not go i would rather remain in paris and not go away from my family i would rather confess all to them and die with them if it must be so you refuse me then said m ferrand repressing his rage and looking fixedly at me why have you so suddenly changed your mind not a minute ago you accepted my offer i saw that if he guessed my motive i was lost so i replied that i did not then think that he desired me to leave paris and my family but you dishonour your family you wretched girl he exclaimed and unable any longer to restrain himself he seized me by the arms and shook me so violently that i fell i will give you until the day after to-morrow he cried and then you shall go from here to the martial or go and inform your father that i have turned you out of my house and will send him to jail to-morrow he then left me stretched on the floor whence i had not the power to rise madame seraphin had run in when she heard her master raise his voice so loud and with her assistance and staggering at every step i regained my chamber where i threw myself on my bed and remained until night so entirely was i prostrated by all that had happened by the pains that came on about one o'clock in the morning i felt assured that i should be prematurely a mother why did you not summon assistance oh i did not dare m ferrand was anxious to get rid of me and he would certainly have sent for dr vincent who would have killed me at my master's instead of killing me at the martial or else m ferrand would have stifled me and said that i had died in my confinement alas sir perhaps these were vain terrors but they came over me at this moment and caused my suffering otherwise i would have endured the shame and should never have been accused of killing my child instead of calling for help and for fear my cries should be heard i stuffed my mouth full with the bedclothes at length after dreadful anguish alone in the midst of darkness the child was born 
and dead i did not kill it indeed i did not kill it ah oh, no in the midst of this fearful night i had one moment of bitter joy and that was when i pressed my child in my arms and the voice of louise was stifled with sobs morel had listened to his daughter's recital with a mournful apathy and indifference which alarmed rodolph however seeing her burst into tears the lapidary who was still leaning on his workboard with his two hands pressed against his temples looked at louise steadfastly and said she weeps she weeps why is she weeping then after a moment's hesitation ah uh, yes i know i know the notary isn't it go on my poor louise you are my daughter i love you still just now i did not recognize you my eyes were darkened with my tears oh my head how badly it aches my head my head you do not believe me guilty do you father do you oh no no it is a terrible misfortune but i was so fearful of the notary the notary ah yes and well you might be he is so wicked so very wicked but will you forgive me now yes yes really and truly yes ah yes i love you the same as ever although i cannot not say you see because oh my head my head louise looked at rodolph in extreme alarm he is suffering deeply but let him calm himself go on louise after looking twice or thrice at morel with great disquietude thus resumed i clasped my infant to my breast and was astonished at not hearing it breathe i said to myself the breathing of a baby is so faint that it is difficult to hear it but then it was so cold i had no light for they would never leave one with me i waited until the dawn came trying to keep it warm as well as i could but it seemed to me colder and colder i said to myself then it freezes so hard that it must be cold that chills it so at daybreak i carried my child to the window and looked at it it was stiff and cold i placed my mouth to its mouth to try and feel its breath i put my hand on its heart but it did not beat it was dead and louise burst into tears oh at this moment she continued something passed within me which it is impossible to describe i only remember confusedly what followed it was like a dream it was at once despair terror rage and above all i was seized with another fear i no longer feared m ferrand would strangle me but i feared that if they found my child dead by my side i should be accused of having killed it then i had but one thought and that was to conceal the corpse from everybody's sight and then my dishonour would not be known and i should no longer have to dread my father's anger i should escape from m ferrand's vengeance because i could now leave his house obtain another situation and gain something to help and support my family alas sir such were the reasons which induced me not to say anything but try and hide my child's remains from all eyes i was wrong i know but in the situation in which i was oppressed on all sides worn out by suffering and almost mad i did not consider to what i exposed myself if i should be discovered what torture what torture said rodolph with deep sympathy the day was advancing continued louise and i had but a few moments before me until the household would be stirring i hesitated no longer but wrapping up the unhappy babe as well as i could i descended the staircase silently and went to the bottom of the garden to try and make a hole in the ground to bury it but it had frozen so hard in the night that i could not dig up the earth so i concealed the body in the bottom of a sort of cellar into which no one entered during the winter and then i covered it up with an empty box which had held flowers and returned to my apartment without any person having seen me of all i tell you sir i have but a very confused recollection weak as i was it is inexplicable to me how i had strength and courage to do all i did at nine o'clock madame seraphin came to inquire why i had not risen i told her that i was very ill and prayed of her to allow me to remain in bed during the day and that on the following day i should quit the house as m ferrand had dismissed me at the end of an hour's time he came himself you are worse to-day 
ah that is the consequence of your obstinacy said he if you had taken advantage of my kind offer you would to-day have been comfortably settled with some worthy people who would have taken every care of you but i will not be so cruel as to leave you without help in your present situation and this evening dr vincent shall come and see you at this threat i shuddered but i replied to m ferrand that i was wrong to refuse his offers the evening before and that i would now accept them but that being too ill to move then i could not go until the day after the next to the martial and that it was useless to send for dr vincent i only sought to gain time for i had made up my mind to leave the house and go the next day to my father whom i hoped to keep in ignorance of all relying on my promise m ferrand was almost kind to me and for the first time in his life recommended madame seraphin to take care of me i passed the day in mental agony trembling every instant lest the body of my child should be accidentally discovered i was only anxious that the frost should break up so that the ground not being so hard i might be able to dig it up the snow began to fall and that gave me some hopes i remained all day in bed and when the night came i waited until every one should be asleep and then i summoned strength enough to rise and go to the wood closet where i found a chopper with which i hoped to dig a hole in the ground which was covered with snow after immense trouble i succeeded and then taking the body i wept bitterly over it and buried it as well as i could in the little box that had held flowers i did not know the prayer for the dead but i said a pater and ave and prayed to the good god to receive it into paradise i thought my courage would fail me when i was covering the mould over the sort of beer i had made a mother burying her own child at length i completed my task and ah what it cost me i covered the place all over with snow that it might conceal every trace of what i had done the moon had lighted me yet when all was done i could hardly resolve to go away poor little innocent in the icy ground beneath the snow although it was dead yet i still seemed to fear that it must feel the cold at length i returned to my chamber and when i got into bed i was in a violent fever in the morning m ferrand sent to know how i found myself i replied that i was a little better and that i felt sure i should be strong enough to go next day into the country i remained the whole of the day in bed hoping to acquire a little strength and in the evening i arose and went down into the kitchen to warm myself i was then quite alone and then went out into the garden to say a last prayer as i went up to my room i met m germain on the landing-place of the study in which he wrote sometimes looking very pale he said to me hastily placing a rouleau of money in my hand they are going to arrest your father to-morrow morning for an overdue bill of thirteen hundred francs he is unable to pay it but here is the money as soon as it is light run to him it was only to-day that i found out what sort of a man m ferrand is and he is a villain i will unmask him above all do not say that you have the money from me m germain did not even give me time to thank him but ran quickly downstairs this morning continued louise before any one had risen at m ferrand's i came here with the money which m germain had given to save my father but it was not enough and but for your generosity i could not have rescued him from the bailiff's hands probably after i had left they went into my room and having suspicions have now sent to arrest me one last service sir said louise taking the rouleau of gold from her pocket will you give back this money to m germain i had promised him not to say to any one that he was employed at m ferrand's but since you know it i have not broken my confidence now sir i repeat to you before god who hears me that i have not said a word that is not quite true i have not tried to hide my faults and but suddenly interrupting herself louise exclaimed with alarm sir sir look at my father what can be the matter with him End of chapter two part three read by celine major chapter two part four of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by celine major the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene sue chapter two part four of the arrest 
morel had heard the latter part of this narration with a dull indifference which rodolph had accounted for by attributing it to the heavy additional misfortune which had occurred to him after such violent and repeated shocks his tears must have dried up his sensibility have become lost he had not even the strength left to feel anger as rodolph thought but rodolph was mistaken as the flame of a candle which is nearly extinguished dies away and recovers so morel's reason already much shaken wavered for some time throwing out now and then some small rays of intelligence and then suddenly all was darkness absolutely unconscious of what was said or passing around him for some time the lapidary had become quite insane although his hand-wheel was placed on the other side of his working-table and he had not in his hands either stones or tools yet the occupied artisan was feigning the operations of his daily labour and affecting to use his implements he accompanied this pantomime with a sort of noise with his tongue against the roof of his mouth in imitation of the noise of his lathe in its rotatory motions but sir said louise again with increasing fright look pray look at my father then approaching the artisan she said to him father father morel gazed on his daughter with that troubled vague distracted wandering look which characterizes the insane and without discontinuing his assumed labour he replied in a low and melancholy tone i owe the notary thirteen hundred francs it is the price of louise's blood so i must work 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 oh i'll pay i'll pay i'll pay can it be possible this cannot be he is not mad no no exclaimed louise in a heart-rending voice he will recover it is but a momentary fit of absence morel my good fellow said rodolph to him we are here your daughter is near you she is innocent thirteen hundred francs said the lapidary not attending to rodolph but going on with his sham employment my father exclaimed louise throwing herself at his feet and clasping his hands in her own in spite of his resistance it is i it is your louise thirteen hundred francs he repeated resting his hands from the grasp of his daughter thirteen hundred francs and if not he added in a low and as it were confidential tone and if not louise is to be guillotined and again he imitated the turning of his lathe louise gave a piercing shriek he is mad she exclaimed he is mad and it is i it is i who am the cause oh yet it is not my fault i did not desire to do ill it was that monster courage courage my poor girl said rodolph let us hope that this attack is but momentary your father has suffered so much so many troubles all at once were more than he could bear his reason wanders for a moment it will soon be restored but my mother my grandmother my sisters my brothers what will become of them all exclaimed louise now they are deprived of my father and myself they must die of hunger misery and despair am i not here make your mind easy they shall want for nothing courage i say to you your disclosure will bring about the punishment of a great criminal you have convinced me of your innocence and i have no doubt but that it will be discovered and proclaimed ah sir you see dishonour madness death see the miseries which that man causes and yet no one can do anything against him nothing the very thought completes all my wretchedness so far from that let the contrary thought help to support you what mean you sir take with you the assurance that your father yourself and your family shall be avenged avenged yes that i swear to you replied rodolph solemnly i swear to you that his crimes shall be exposed and this man shall bitterly expiate the dishonour madness and death which he has caused if the laws are powerless to reach him if his cunning and skill equal his misdeeds then his cunning must be met by cunning his skill must be counteracted by skill his misdeeds faced by other misdeeds but which shall be to his but a just and avenging retribution inflicted on a guilty wretch by an inexorable hand when compared to a cowardly and base murder ah sir may heaven hear you it is no longer myself whom i seek to avenge but a poor distracted father my child killed in its birth then trying another effort to turn morel from his insanity louise again exclaimed 
a dear father they are going to lead me to prison and i shall never see you again it is your poor louise who bids you adieu my father my father my father to this distressing appeal there was no response in that poor destroyed mind there was no echo none the paternal cords always the last broken no longer vibrated the door of the garret opened the commissary entered my moments are numbered sir said he to rodolph i declare to you with much regret that i cannot allow this conversation to be protracted any longer this conversation is ended sir replied rodolph bitterly and pointing to the lapidary louise has nothing more to say to her father he has nothing more to hear from his daughter he is a lunatic i feared as much it is really frightful exclaimed the magistrate and approaching the workman hastily after a minute's scrutiny he was convinced of the sad reality ah oh, sir said he sorrowfully to rodolph i had already expressed my sincerest wishes that the innocence of this young girl might be discovered but after such a misfortune i will not confine myself to good wishes no no i will speak of this honest and distressed family i will speak of this fearful and last blow which has overwhelmed it and do not doubt but that the judges will have an additional motive to find the accused innocent thanks thanks sir said rodolph by acting thus it will not be a mere duty that you fulfil but a holy office which you undertake believe me sir our duty is always such a painful one that it is most grateful to us to be interested in anything which is worthy and good one word more sir the disclosures of louise morel have fully convinced me of her innocence will you be so kind as to inform me how her pretended crime was discovered or rather denounced this morning said the magistrate a housekeeper in the service of m ferrand the notary came and disposed before me that after the hasty departure of louise morel whom she knew to be seven months advanced in the family way she went into the young girl's apartment and was convinced that she had been prematurely confined footsteps had been traced in the snow which had led to the detection of a body of a new-born child buried in the garden after this declaration i went myself to the rue du sentier and found m jacques ferrand most indignant that such a scandalous affair should have happened in his house the curé of the church bonne nouvelle whom he had sent for also declared to me that louise morel had owned her fault in his presence one day when on this account she was imploring the indulgence and pity of her master that besides he had often heard m ferrand give louise morel the most serious warnings telling her that sooner or later she would be lost a prediction added the abbe which has been unfortunately fulfilled the indignation of m ferrand continued the magistrate seemed to me so just and natural that i shared in it he told me that no doubt louise morel had taken refuge with her father i came hither instantly for the crime being flagrant i was empowered to proceed by immediate apprehension rodolph with difficulty restrained himself when he heard of the indignation of m ferrand and said to the magistrate i thank you a thousand times sir for your kindness and the support you promise louise i will take care that this poor man as well as his wife's mother are sent to a lunatic asylum then addressing louise who was still kneeling close to her father endeavouring but vainly to recall him to his senses make up your mind my poor girl to go without taking leave of your mother spare her the pain of such a parting be assured that she shall be taken care of and nothing shall in future be wanting to your family for a woman shall be found who will take care of your mother and occupy herself with your brothers and sisters under the superintendence of your kind neighbour mademoiselle rigolette as for your father nothing shall be spared to make his return to reason as rapid as it is complete courage believe me honest people are often severely tried by misfortune but they always come out of these struggles more pure more strong and more respected two hours after the apprehension of louise the lapidary and the old idiot mother were by rodolph's orders taken to the bicetre by david where they were to be kept in private rooms and to receive particular care morel left the house in the rue du temple without resistance indifferent as he was he went wherever they led him his lunacy was gentle inoffensive and melancholy the grandmother was hungry and when they showed her bread and meat she followed the bread and meat the jewels of the lapidary entrusted to his wife were the same day given to madame mathieu the jewel-matcher 
who fetched them unfortunately she was watched and followed by tortillard who knew the value of the pretended false stones in consequence of the conversation he had overheard during the time morel was arrested by the bailiffs the son of bras rouge discovered that she lived boulevard saint denis number eleven rigolette apprised madeleine morel with considerable delicacy of the fit of lunacy which had attacked the lapidary and of louise's imprisonment at first madeleine wept bitterly and uttered terrible shrieks then the first burst of her grief over the poor creature weak and overcome consoled herself as well as she could by seeing that she and her children were surrounded by the many comforts which she owed to the generosity of their benefactor as to rodolph his thoughts were very poignant when he considered the disclosures of louise nothing is more common he said than this corrupting of the female servant by the master either by consent or against it sometimes by terror and surprise sometimes by the imperious nature of those relations which create servitude this depravity descending from the rich to the poor despising in its selfish desire the sanctity of the domestic hearth this depravity still most deplorable when it is voluntarily submitted to becomes hideous frightful when it is satisfied with violence it is an impure and brutal slavery an ignoble and barbarous tyranny over a fellow-creature who in her fright replies to the solicitations of her master by her tears and to his declarations with a shudder of fear and disgust and then continued rodolph what is the consequence to the female almost invariably there follow degradation misery prostitution theft and sometimes infanticide and yet the laws are as yet strangers to this crime every accomplice of a crime has the punishment of that crime every receiver is considered as guilty as the thief that is justice but when a man wantonly seduces a young innocent and pure girl renders her a mother abandons her leaving her but shame disgrace despair and driving her perchance to infanticide a crime for which she forfeits her life is this man considered as her accomplice pooh what then follows oh tis nothing nothing but a little love affair the whim of the day for a pair of bright eyes then she is left and he looks out for the next still more it is just possible that the man may be of an original an inquisitive turn perhaps at the same time an excellent brother and son and may go to the bar of the criminal court and see his paramour tried for her life if by chance he should be subpoenaed as a witness he may amuse himself by saying to the persons desirous of having the poor girl executed as soon as possible for the greater edification of the public morals i have something important to disclose to justice speak gentlemen of the jury this unhappy female was pure and virtuous it is true i seduced her that is equally true she bore me a child that is also true after that as she has a light complexion i completely forsook her for a pretty brunette that is still more true but in doing so i have only followed out an imprescriptible right a sacred right which society recognizes and accords to me the truth is this young man is perfectly in the right the jury would say one to another there is no law which prevents a young man from seducing a fair girl and then forsaking her for a brunette he is a gay young chap and that's all now gentlemen of the jury this unhappy girl is said to have killed her child i will say our child because i abandoned her because finding herself alone and in the deepest misery she became frightened and lost her senses and wherefore because having as she says to bring up and feed her child it was impossible that she could continue to work regularly at her occupation and gain a livelihood for herself and this pledge of our love but i think these reasons quite unworthy of consideration allow me to say gentlemen of the jury could she not have gone to the lying-in hospital if there was room for her could she not at the critical moment have gone to the magistrate of her district and made a declaration of her shame so that she might have had the authority for placing her child in the enfant trouvé in fact could she not whilst i was playing billiards at the coffee-house whilst awaiting my other mistress could she not have extricated herself from this affair by some genteeler mode than this for gentlemen of the jury i will admit that i consider this way of disposing of the pledge of our loves as rather too unceremonious and rude 
under the idea of thus quietly escaping all future care and trouble what is it enough for a young girl to lose her character brave contempt infamy and have an illegitimate child no but she must also educate the child take care of it bring it up give it a business and make an honest man of it if it be a boy like his father or an honest girl who does not turn wanton like her mother for really maternity has its sacred duties and the wretches who trample them under foot are natural mothers who deserve an exemplary and notable punishment as proof of which gentlemen of the jury i beg you will unhesitatingly hand over this miserable woman to the executioner and you will thus do your duty like independent firm and enlightened citizens dixie this gentleman looks at the question in a very moral point of view will say some hat-maker or retired furrier who is foreman of the jury he has done i faith what we should all have done in his place for the girl is very pretty though rather pallid in complexion this gay spark as the song says has kissed and has prattled with fifty fair maids and changed them as oft do you see and there is no law against that as to this unfortunate girl after all it is her own fault why did she not repulse him then she would not have committed a crime a monstrous crime which really puts all society to the blush and the hatter or the furrier would be right perfectly right what is there to criminate this gentleman of what complicity direct or indirect moral or material can he be charged this lucky rogue has seduced a pretty girl and he it is who has brought her there he does not deny it where is the law that prevents or punishes him society merely says there are gay young fellows abroad let the pretty girls beware but if a poor wretch through want or stupidity constraint or ignorance of the laws which he cannot read buys knowingly a rag which has been stolen he will be sent to the galleys for twenty years as a receiver if such be the punishment for the theft itself this is logical powerful reasoning without receivers there would be no thieves without thieves there would be no receivers no no more pity then even less pity for him who excites to the evil than he who perpetrates it let the smallest degree of complicity be visited with terrible punishment good there is in that a serious and fertile thought high and moral we should bow before society which had dictated such a law but we remember that this society so inexorable towards the smallest complicity of crime against things is so framed that a simple and ingenuous man who should try to prove that there is at least moral similarity material complicity between the fickle seducer and the seduced and forsaken girl would be laughed at as a visionary and if this simple man were to assert that without a father there would in all probability not be offspring society would exclaim against the atrocity the folly and it would be right quite right for after all this gay youth who might say these fine things to the jury however little he might like tragic emotions might yet go tranquilly to see his mistress executed executed for child murder a crime to which he was an accessory nay more the author in consequence of his shameless abandonment does not this charming protection granted to the male portion of society for certain gay doings suggested by the god of love show plainly that france still sacrifices to the graces and is still the most gallant nation in the world End of chapter two read by celine major chapter three of the mysteries of paris volume three this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Céline Major. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three by Eugène Sue. Chapter Three. Jacques Ferrand. At the period when the events were passing, which we are now relating, at one end of the Rue du Sentier, a long old wall extended, covered with a coat of whitewash, and the top garnished with a row of broken flint glass bottles this wall bounding on one side the garden of jacques ferrand the notary terminated with a corps de logis facing the street only one story high with garrets two large escutcheons of gilt copper emblems of the notarial residence flanked the worn-eaten porte cochere of which the primitive colour was no longer to be distinguished under the mud which covered it 
this entrance led to an open passage on the right was the lodge of an old porter almost deaf who was to the body of tailors what m pipelet was to the body of bootmakers on the left a stable used as a cellar wash-house wood-house and the establishment of a rising colony of rabbits belonging to the porter who was dissipating the sorrows of a recent widowhood by bringing up these domestic animals beside the lodge was the opening of a twisting staircase narrow and dark leading to the office as was announced to the clients by a hand painted black whose forefinger was directed towards these words also painted in a black upon the wall the office on the first floor on one side of a large paved court overgrown with grass were empty stables on the other side a rusty iron gate which shut in the garden at the bottom the pavilion inhabited only by the notary a flight of eight or ten steps of disjointed stones which were moss-grown and time-worn led to this square pavilion consisting of a kitchen and other underground offices a ground floor a first floor and the top rooms in one of which louise had slept the pavilion also appeared in a state of great dilapidation there were deep chinks in the walls the window frames and outside blinds once painted grey had become almost black by time the six windows on the first floor looking out into the courtyard had no curtains a sort of greasy and opaque deposit covered the glass on the ground floor there were visible through the window panes more transparent faded yellow cotton curtains with red bindings on the garden side the pavilion had only four windows the garden overgrown with parasitical plants seemed wholly neglected there was no flower border not a bush a clump of elms five or six large green trees some acacias and elder trees a yellowish grass plat half destroyed by moss and the scorch of the sun muddy paths choked up with weeds at the bottom a sort of half cellar for horizon the high naked grey walls of the adjacent houses having here and there skylights barred like prison windows such was the miserable appearance of the garden and dwelling of the notary to this appearance or rather reality m ferrand attached a great importance in the eyes of the vulgar carelessness about comfort almost always passes for disinterestedness dirt for austerity comparing the vast financial luxury of some notaries or the costly toilets of their wives to the dull abode of m ferrand so opposed to elegance expense or splendour clients felt a sort of respect for or rather blind confidence in a man who according to his large practice and the fortune attributed to him could say like many of his professional brethren my carriage my evening party my country house my box at the opera etc but far from this jacques ferrand lived with rigid economy and thus deposits investments powers of attorney in fact all matters of trust and business requiring the most scrupulous and recognized integrity accumulated in his hands living thus meanly as he did the notary lived in the way he liked he detested the world show dearly purchased pleasures and even had it been otherwise he would unhesitatingly have sacrificed his dearest inclinations to the appearances which he found it so profitable to assume a word or two on the character of the man he was one of the children of the large family of misers misers are generally exhibited in a ridiculous and whimsical light the worst do not go beyond egotism or harshness the greater portion increase their fortune by continually investing some they are but few lend at thirty per cent the most decided hardly venture any risk with their means but it is almost an unheard-of thing for a miser to proceed to crime even murder in the acquisition of fresh wealth that is easily accounted for avarice is especially a negative passion the miser in his incessant calculations thinks more of becoming richer by not dispersing in tightening around him more and more the limits of strict necessity than he does of enriching himself at the cost of another he is especially the martyr to preservation weak timid cunning distrustful and above all prudent and circumspect never offensive indifferent to the ills of his neighbour the miser at least never alludes to these ills he is before all and above all the man of certainty and surety or rather he is only a miser because he believes only in the substantial the hard gold which he has locked up in his chest 
speculations and loans on even undoubled security tempt him but little for how improbable soever it may be they always offer a chance of loss and he prefers rather to lose the interest of his money than expose his capital a man so timorous will therefore seldom have the savage energy of the wretch who risks the galleys or his neck to lay hands on the wealth of another risk is a word erased from the vocabulary of the miser it is in this sense that jacques ferrand was let us say a very singular exception perhaps a new variety of the genus miser for jacques ferrand did risk and a great deal he relied on his craft which was excessive on his hypocrisy which was unbounded on his intellect which was elastic and fertile on his boldness which was devilish in assuring him impunity for his crimes and they were already numerous jacques ferrand was a twofold exception usually these adventurous energetic spirits which do not recoil before any crime that will procure gold are beset by turbulent passions gaming dissipation gluttony or other pleasures jacques ferrand knew none of these violent and stormy desires cunning and patient as a forger cruel and resolute as an assassin he was as sober and regular as harpagon one passion alone was active within him and this we have seen too fatally exhibited in his early conduct to louise the loan of thirteen hundred francs to morel at high interest was in ferrand's hands a snare a means of oppression and a source of profit sure of the lapidary's honesty he was certain of being repaid in full some day or other still louise's beauty must have made a deep impression on him to have made him lay out of a sum of money so advantageously placed except this weakness jacques ferrand loved gold only he loved gold for gold's sake not for the enjoyments it procured he was a stoic not for the enjoyments it might procure he was not sufficiently poetical to enjoy speculatively like some misers with regard to what belonged to himself he loved possession for possession's sake with regard to what belonged to others if it concerned a large deposit for instance liberally confided to his probity only he experienced in returning this deposit the same agony the same despair as the goldsmith cardillac did in separating himself from a casket of jewels which his own exquisite taste had fashioned into a chef-d'oeuvre of art with the notary his character for extreme probity was his chef-d'oeuvre of art a deposit was to him a jewel which he could not surrender but with poignant regrets what care what cunning what stratagems what skill in a word what art did he use to attract this sum into his own strong-box still maintaining that extreme character for honour which was beset with the most precious marks of confidence like the pearls and diamonds and the golden diadems of cardillac the more this celebrated goldsmith approached perfection they say the more value did he attach to his ornaments always considering the last as his chef-d'oeuvre and being utterly distressed at giving it up the more jacques ferrand grew perfect in crime the more he clung to the open and constant marks of confidence which were showered upon him always considering his last deceit as his chef-d'oeuvre we shall see in the sequel of this history that by the aid of certain means really prodigious in plan and carrying out he contrived to appropriate to himself with impunity several very considerable sums his secret and mysterious life gave him incessant and terrible emotions such as gaming gives to the gambler against all other men's fortunes jacques ferrand staked his hypocrisy his boldness his head and he played on velvet as it is called far out of reach of human justice which he vulgarly and energetically characterized as a chimney which might fall on one's head for him to lose was not to gain and moreover he was so criminally gifted that in his bitter irony he saw a continued gain in boundless esteem the unlimited confidence which he inspired not only in a multitude of rich clients but also in the smaller tradespeople and workmen of his district a great many of these placed their money with him saying he is not charitable it is true he is a devotee and that's a pity but he is much safer than the government or the savings banks in spite of this uncommon ability this man had committed two of those mistakes from which the most skilful rogues do not always escape forced by circumstances it is true he had associated with himself two accomplices this immense fault as he called it had been in part repaired 
neither of his two associates could destroy him without destroying themselves and neither would have reaped from denunciation any other profit but of drawing down justice on themselves as well as on the notary on this score he was quite easy besides he was not at the end of his crimes and the disadvantages of accompliceship were balanced by the criminal aid which at times he still obtained a few words as to the personal appearance of m ferrand and we will introduce the reader into the notary's study where we shall encounter some of the principal personages in this recital m ferrand was fifty years of age but did not appear forty he was of middle height with broad and stooping shoulders powerful thick-set strong-limbed red-haired and naturally as her suit as a bear his hair was flat on his temples his forehead bald his eyebrows scarcely perceptible his bilious complexion was almost concealed by innumerable red spots and when strong emotion agitated him his yellow and murky countenance was injected with blood and became a livid red his face was as flat as a death's head as is vulgarly said his nose thick and fat his lips so thin so imperceptible that his mouth seemed incised in his face and when he smiled with his villainous and revolting air his teeth seemed as though supplied by black and rotten fangs his pallid face had an expression at once austere and devout impassable and inflexible cold and reflective whilst his small black animated peering and restless eyes were lost behind large green spectacles jacques ferrand saw admirably well but sheltered by his glasses he had an immense advantage he could observe without being observed and well he knew how often a glance is unwittingly full of meaning in spite of his imperturbable audacity he had met twice or thrice in his life certain potent and magnetic looks before which his own had compulsorily been lowered and in some important circumstances it is fatal to lower the eyes before the man who interrogates accuses or judges you the large spectacles of m ferrand were thus a kind of covert retrenchment whence he could reconnoitre and observe every movement of the enemy and all the world was the notary's enemy because all the world was more or less his dupe and accusers are but enlightened or disgusted dupes he affected a negligence in his dress almost amounting to dirtiness or rather he was naturally so his chin shaven only every two or three days his grimy and wrinkled head his broad nails encircled in black his unpleasant odour his threadbare coat his greasy hat his coarse neckcloth his black worsted stockings his clumsy shoes all curiously betokened his worthiness with his clients by giving him an air of disregard of the world and an air of practical philosophy which delighted them they said what tastes what passions what feelings what weaknesses must the notary sacrifice to obtain the confidence he inspires he gains perhaps sixty thousand francs two thousand four hundred livres a year and his household consists of a servant and an old housekeeper his only pleasure is to go on sundays to mass and vespers and he knows no opera comparable to the grave chanting of the organ no worldly society which is worth an evening quietly passed at his fireside corner with the curé of the parish after a frugal dinner in fine he places his enjoyment in probity his pride in honour his happiness in religion such was the opinion of the contemporaries of m jacques ferrand End of chapter three read by Celine Major.